good morning. We have arrived at the final lecture of the course. Before I introduce today's illustrious presenters, I want to say from all of us in the teaching team at the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets, thank you for attending and actively participating in the course. We hope you have enjoyed it as much as we have. Okay, today we end with a bank. We have a presentation by, by Dr. Juan Sebastián Galán and Dr. James Robinson. Juan Sebastián is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Los Andes in Colombia. He received a PhD in political economy from Harvard University. His research interests are focused in Latin America's institutional and cultural foundations of economic development. James Robinson is the Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies and the Director of the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts at the University of Chicago. Dr. Robinson has conducted influential research in the field of political and economic development and the relationships between political power and institutions and prosperity. Professors, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jesus and Fernando, for inviting us to, to this lecture. We're super excited to be here uh, and to talk about the past and the future of Latin Americans' uh, economic development. Uh, when James and I started thinking about the, this presentation, we, we wanted to convey a message of optimism and possibilities for the continent. So that's what we're going to try to do in this presentation. And you know, if you look at the most salient fact, I guess, of Latin America for the past 200 years is that it has been, uh, it hasn't been an economically successful, uh, followed an economically successful trajectory over the last uh, 200 years, in particular in relation to uh, North America, right? Um, and most of the conventional wisdom in economics paints the picture that this has to do with uh, the high levels and extreme levels of inequality, something that you must have seen in the course uh, throughout this semester, right? This goes back to a seminal paper from Engelman and Sokolov in 1997, uh, where they painted this picture of extreme inequality uh, uh, being born out of the different forms that colonialism took place in Latin America and the United States, right? And the fact that uh, in Latin America, the Spanish set up uh, a set of extractive institutions that exploited indigenous populations, slavery, right? And that somehow there is a path dependent path um, uh, whereby these results have persisted over time, right? Um, and that uh, extractive and economic uh, political institutions have uh, persisted throughout the continent, right? Um, I think uh, most, if you look at, in, uh, at the economics literature, right? And, you know, Felipe Valencia's lecture on Tuesday was very good at summarizing this picture, right? Has tried to document this path dependence, right? And if you think about it, it's a very pessimistic view of history too. It's very deterministic, right? So there is this famous paper by Melissa Dell, right? And others who have tried to show this. And even if you think about uh, uh, differences in political institutions or economic institutions that were produced after independence, somehow these uh, institutions get captured by an elite, right? And so democratization has somehow been captured um, by an elite. And even if there is a change in elites and a turnover of elites, you know, somehow the system, right, that uh, of state weakness, of clientelism, of weak institutions sort of um, forces new elites to uh, go back to the old ways. This is summarized in this very famous law for iron, iron law of oligarchy that was put forth by Mitchell's early in, in the 20th century by the, the sociology. Um, I guess one of the things that we thought of here is that there are also uh, other aspects of economic persistence and inequality persistence, right? Throughout Latin America that don't have to do really with you know, political institutions, but more of a sociological or cultural values that are deeply entrenched in the Latin American psyche, right? So here I'm showing you a, a section uh, from the mates uniform in Cachihuaches, which is a very fancy uh, store in one of the fanciest uh, neighborhoods in Bogota. And you can see here, you know, this is how or we think uh, 
and this has been actually uh, not really well been studied. Um, in another way of that inequality reproduces itself, right? Uh, the way that social hierarchies are hierarchies are developed in the continent, the way that cultural values transmit uh, inequality, is something that that also is very important. So if you think about the Engerman and Sokolov world, right? Um, Ameri Latin America is sort of trapped in these very extractive institutions, high inequality. And the more that Latin America uh, behaves like North America, uh, the more it can be so successful, right? So uh, if, if, we, if, you, if you try to uh, think about this, from a historical perspective, this is not a new vision, right? A lot of Latin American intellectuals in the 19th century thought about uh, this problem in the same way that we needed to import economic or political models from North America or Europe. Um, a prime example of this, for example, is uh, Domingo Sarmiento, right? He was a, a, a famous uh, Argentinian politician, right? First a governor, uh, uh, a governor of San Juan, then president of the Republic, in a famous book that became a, a really very important literary piece in the continent called Facundo. He paints this dual view of Latin America and the future and the possibilities of Latin America, right? That could be either barbarism, right? personified by the rural world of Latin America, the gaucho in the case of Argentina, but in other places like the Llanos here in Colombia, this very uh, underdeveloped rural world where there is chaos and caudillos come in and try to impose order in a very selective way. And that's the story actually of Facundo, right? The main character of his book or civilization, right? And civilization in his way of thinking meant, you know, the world of the city and the way of Europe. And so what Latin America needed to do if, if, if he wanted to succeed, right, was basically to uh, foster, for example, European migration. You know, there were more uh, educated people in Europe and European ways of thinking about Latin America. Okay, so. So this is, this is a picture of his famous book. Uh, again, that goes back to 1845. And, you know, but if you look at history, right, the attempts of Latin America to copy or imitate uh, development models or even the advice of economists from other places, right, um, have not really worked well. So if you think about, you know, the Washington consensus or, or other potential uh, policies that the continent has tried to um, implement, those have not been uh, true successes in the sense that they have not changed the trajectory, the long run trajectory of Latin America, right? So you think about maybe in absolute terms, we are better off than in the 1990s, um, not obviously all everywhere across the continent, but on average, but relative to the United States, we're pretty much in the same place that uh, we were a hundred years ago or even 150 years ago. Right. So in contrast to this view, actually, uh, there was another set of Latin American intellectuals in the 19th century that saw a different world and uh, a lot of possibilities for Latin America. Um, a prime example of this, actually, and that we liked a lot, is this essay by uh, Jose Martí, um, which was uh, the father of the Cuban independence. No? And, a founder of the Cuban Re Revolutionary Party in the 19th century. Um, and he, he, he wrote this essay, Our America, Nuestra America, uh, basically an appeal to differentiate ourselves from the United States and from the European models and to actually look inside ourselves and try to think about what were our prime attributes uh, that could be harnessed in socially desirable ways to, uh, to uh, develop the continent, right? And so he has, he has in particular this view that there was a mismatch between the ideas important from Europe or from North America with the Latin American reality. There is a quote, a famous quote in, in, in this essay, right? And you can see it here. We, 
No, there is no young key or European book that could furnish the key to uh, Latin America, the Latin America enigma. And he was thinking about what Latin America was supposed to do after independence. Um, and uh, if you see the quote, he talks about, you know, after hatred, after, you know, all the violence that ensued, after all the chaos, you know, Latin America, what Latin America needs to do, it's to uh, look inside itself and try to understand who it is, right? He has this, you know, what are we like? He asked at the end, what are we? And how can we channel that into uh, socially desirable ways? So, so you can see that there, is, there are different views about the future, or, or there were different views just after independence about the future and the possibilities of Latin America. And, and, and in particular, uh, he goes on to say afterwards in, in his essay, you know, he has this very nice quote, and I'm just going to read it because I think it's just very, very telling about what it can be, right? You know, to govern well, one must attend closely to the reality of the place that is, um, that is governed, right? In America, the good ruler does not need to know how the German or the Frenchman is governed, but what elements his own country is composed of and how he can marshal them so as to reach by means of institutions from the country itself, right? So he's calling, he's making a call to understand the reality of Latin America. And in fact, he, he clearly paints a different view to uh, Sarmiento and, and he later argues, right, that the battle for the future of Latin America is not between civilization or barbarism, like Sarmiento painted in his essay, but between false erudition, meaning the importation of foreign ideas, foreign models, and the nature of Latin America, right? So it's a call for the, for, 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 for the search of the soul of, of Latin America and what makes us uh, particular. So you think about these two different views of the continent, right? There is clearly a, a, a question about, you know, a deterministic path that is also very present in the Engerman and Sokolov's uh, literature, right? Or whether it, there is actually more agency in the continent that has been historically um, acknowledged, right? And there are two obvious issues in Marti's essay. You know, one is obviously this conventional view that I just mentioned that Latin America is trapped basically in a very perverse equilibrium of extractive institutions, you know, and, you know, if things were or could have been different, and why was no one paying attention to him back back in the days? So, and this goes back to a maybe more fundamental question: is, you know, you know, did really Latin America did, did Latin America have something different to do? Could it do something different, right? And so, what's the scope for change in Latin America? Really, that's one question that. You can, you can derive from Marti's essay. And the second question, which we're really not going to uh, develop too much in this lecture, unfortunately, but hopefully we, we want to open the conversation, right? What exactly is a government in harmony, right? With the country's natural uh, constitution, what it means in reality and what Marti is asking, right? So what are those elements in, of reality in Latin America that can be harnessed again to build our own set of functional institutions, not necessarily similar to those of the US or Europe, but those that are uh, harness again, those um, attributes particular to Latin America and that may become uh, more inclusive in the future to uh, develop also a more um, a more um, inclusive uh, economy, okay? And development trajectory. So here I'm going to turn to James and he's going to continue with the, with the rest of the lecture. Let's tackle the first issue. Uh, let's tackle the first issue to start with, which is, in, uh, which is um, you know, what was the scope for Latin America to do something different? You know, is that, is that, was there really any potential for implementing some alternative design for Latin America. And I think we're going to we're going to talk about that it, kind of using two 
examples. One is a fantastic book by the Argentine legal scholar Roberto Gagarea, who looked at the history of constitutionalism uh, in, in Latin America. And I don't want to go into that to this in great detail, but I think one point of Gargarea's book or two, a couple of points from his book is very important for this discussion, which is actually, if you look at 19th century Latin America, far from there being some deterministic reproduction of colonial institutions, there were all sorts of models on the table, models of society, models of constitutions, models of institution. He sort of creates this trichotomy of there were radical constitutions, there were or radical constitutionalism, there were conservative constitutions, and there were liberal constitutions. And so he shows all of these models were on the table. Eventually, what he calls a conservative liberal synthesis emerges late in the seventh, in the second half of the 19th century. And that looks something like, you know, the Engelman Sokolov constitutionalism, but, but that took 50 years to get there. And there was all sorts of other models around. So I think we want to say that shows, you know, we're going to argue by the end of the lecture, there's a lot of options on the table today, but that's always been true in Latin America, it turns out. The other point of his book, I think, which is very, we think is very interesting, is that he points out that actually there were many different models in the United States as well. You know, yeah, there was this liberal model of Madison and whatever, but Jefferson had a much more radical project. You know, Jefferson said you need to have a revolution every 30 years, you know, otherwise political institutions atrophy. And, and there were also much more conservatives like Alexander Hamilton. You know, Hamilton proposed a Senate for life, for example, at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. So, so there was lots of projects in Latin America and there were lots of projects in North America. So I think this gives a, it's a sort of antidote to this kind of remorseless reproduction of extractive institutions that Juan Sebastián was talking about. Okay, so I'm not sure I want to go into the details of these uh, a bit too much. Just We just wanted to get the idea across here and you can read Gagarea's fabulous book, but it kind of characterizes there were these radical projects, you know, radical projects were everywhere, you know, radical projects were sort of, they were suspicious about checks and balances. They had notions of the general will, Rousseau's idea of the general uh, will. They were kind of highly uh, utopian. You know, uh, Victor Hugo described, the, you know, one of the 19th century liberal constitutions in Colombia as, you know, a constitution for angels, you know. So so I think that so they were they were often uh, utopian uh, and and, you know, they often had weak executives, you know, unable to interfere in the legislature. But that didn't just happen in Latin America. You know, it happened with the Mexican constitution in uh, 1814. It happened in Venezuela, but it also happened, you know, under the US Articles and Confederation, there was no president. You know, all the power was in the, the legislatures. And, you know, pre before that, there were other constitutions in the US like that. So there were radical, you know, ones which involved kind of homog homogenization, maybe land reform, mass kind of education, government support for education. So, so, so there was a lot of, you know, and you can think of some of these names, Artigas, Hidalgo, exactly, Morelos in Mexico. Okay. Of course, there were conservative constitutions, very different types of projects. Here are some of the examples that Gargarea talks about Chile, you know, in the 1820s, 1830s, Ecuador, Peru, you know. So lots of countries had these conservative Colombia in the starting in the 1880s, um, you know, much more skepticism about participation, concentrated power in the executive. Um, you know, focus on uh, property rights, very different from a sort of Jeffersonian idea of radical kind of redistribution uh, and an emphasis on, you know, what Gagarin calls moral perfectionism. And then there were liberal constitutions, uh, the U.S. Constitution, of course, written in Philadelphia. But, you know, the Argentine Constitution of 1853 he classifies as a sort of classical liberal constitution with all the things we know, checks and balances, judicial reviews, etc., OK, so in the end, a sort of fusion of this liberal and conservative type of constitutionalism came about uh, with more power in the executive than the United States, fewer checks and balances, etc. But but it just took time for it to happen. I think that's the image we want to get across. OK, there were multiple possibilities in 19th century Latin America. There were current ideologies everywhere, including in North America. You know, it wasn't North America wasn't so distinct at this level. Uh, 
he paints a very interesting picture. It's not that colonial institutions didn't matter. It's not that there isn't some element of path dependence, but you have to see it through this window of agency and kind of alternative possibility. So, you know, he sort of says, well, you know, there was a relative lack of a history of self-government in colonial Latin America relative to North America. So so that that was important. Yes, there was greater levels of inequality. So, you know, elites did find democracy maybe more threatening than in the United States. So so but 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 there was a lot of different options, different paths one could have go could go in. And I say we don't have time, we're not going to go into it. But I think, you know, it's worth it's very worth someone interested in contemporary Latin America and interested in like President Lopez Obrador and things like that. What the heck is that? Well, actually, you know, there's a lot. It resonates a lot with some of these 19th century radical constitutional projects. You know, the general will, this notion of el pueblo, you know, the kind of antipathy towards checks and balances and institutions, the direct relationship between leaders and the people. You know, that that's that's there in 19th century Latin America as well. So it's much more deeply rooted. OK, so that's the first point we want to do to kind of like put pressure on this 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 conventional wisdom and here's another you know wonderful book uh by joshua simon who's a political theorist at johns hopkins now called the ideology of creole revolution and his book is very it's very synergetic with gargarea in the sense that he focuses very much on you know the ideas were very similar so it's a sort of intellectual study of simon bolivar Alexander Hamilton and Lucas Alaman in Mexico sort of showing that these people were all trying to solve the same kind of problem. You know, they were all Creole elites. Uh, uh, they were, you know, they were trying to get independence from the colonial power. And then they were trying to set up institutions to cement their own power to kind of deal with the allocation of frontier land, to deal with the control of indigenous people and slaves. And so these these the problems were similar at the end of the day you know and and many of the ideas that they discussed were similar and they all actually conversed on pretty similar solutions to that uh problem so so the first part of his book is sort of very much in consonant with what i was just saying about these ideas being very many of these ideas were in discussed and whatever you know so as i said you know at the constitutional convention in philadelphia hamilton stood up and said you know we want to have a senate we should have a senate for life that's exactly what bolivar uh proposed proposed also in his constitutional designs okay but then the last part of a book is you know is less about these converging ideologies but sort of say okay fine but we know that the us ended up different it ended up very different so if all the ideas were very similar how did it end up so different? And 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 his argument is again, this is much more about this is much more contingent than we than than the conventional wisdom allows. You know, so his argument is that you know I argue that fortune rather than fate decreed that the United States should persist and even expand after independence, despite experiencing conflicts not unlike the ones that tore apart the United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata, Gran Colombia. You know, the sort of which was, you know, Panama, Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador, and the empire of Mexico. So his argument is that what really distinguishes the US from Latin America is the scale and size of the polity that emerged. And all the projects in Latin America sort of disintegrated, and the one in the US somehow kept going. But his argument is there was nothing inevitable about that. It could have fallen apart. And it was just sort of, a, there was a lot of agency early on, which kept the US on the rails. And then that had enormous consequences uh, economically sub subsequently. And he, you know, he makes he makes lots of different, he looks at lots of different examples from Mexico and Argentina and stuff. But just to say, like, you know, one of his com main comparisons is sort of comparing how Gran Colombia fell apart. You know, how did Gran Colombia fall apart? Well, Jose Antonio Pais, who ended up, you know, as the first president of independent Venezuela, was trying to negotiate greater autonomy within this uni union that Bolivar had set up, you know, and Bolivar sent an army to get him under control, but he made a lot of promises to him that were unconstitutional, okay? Uh, uh, that created a backlash, uh, and in order to sort of get the backlash under control, Bolivar ended up taking on supreme power, dictator dictatorial powers in 1828 and getting the title of, you know, liberator president. So the institutions that were set up uh, fell apart over this kind of attempt to make a deal with 
Pais in Venezuela, and Bolivar just decided to set himself up as dictator and the institutions collapsed. And he contrasts this with the 1800 presidential election in the US, where Jefferson and Burr were tied in the electoral college. There were 36 votes tied, 36, they went 73, 73, 73, 73, 73, 73, 36 times they voted in electoral college. They were in this complete stalemate, okay? Uh, the militias, you know, the, the militias, the, the state militias began to mobilize. And the US was teetering on the brink of, of, of a civil war, which of course eventually came in 1865, 65 years later. Uh, but if it had happened at this point, when the Republic was so young, the argument goes, things would have been really different. What happens? In the end, after 36 votes, the delegates from Delaware, Maryland, and Vermont basically sit on their hands and let Jefferson win. And then the system persists. But it could have been different. That's, 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 that's the idea. Okay. So, 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 so. Just to kind of clear the wood away. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so what we want to say here is when you're coming back, Juan Sebastian, you're coming back now. No, I'm going to go to the next slide and then you're coming back, right? Yeah. So let me just observe something here about you know this discussion of Gargarea and you know and Simon, which you know is typical with sort of people who focus on sort of ideas and, and political philosophy is that it's very elite centered, you know, elites, we talk about elites a lot, Engelman and Sokolov talk about elites a lot, you know, uh, I've talked about elites a lot. And, you know, and maybe Bolivar and Lucas Aleman and Hamilton all did think very similar. But but what about what about everybody else, you know, and I think everybody else is going to be an important part of the message today. So here's here I am doing some field work in, in, in Bolivia, in Highland Bolivia, meeting with the officials of the Maiku and the Ayu. So the Maiku is the, the you know, there's the, the, the Ayu is the Quechua word for these local indigenous um, communities and the Maiku is the Aymara word. And here's the Here's the, you know, here's the local, uh, uh, where are they in Gagarea and Simon? Like, where is the natural, where is Latin American society, you know, in, in this intellectual discussion? So I'm sort of, you know, we're kind of praising Gagarea and Simon for actually raising a lot of really interesting, important points here. But there's also something missing, you know, which is going to be an important part of the discussion. Okay. And, you know, this brings the question of change, right? back into the picture, right? And, you know, in, in Angerman and Sokolov view, like there is uh, elites sort of reproduce themselves over time in Latin America and capture basically institutions. But this brings the question of, of who are elites and whether elites have changed or not throughout the history of Latin America, right? And it's obviously true that there has been persistence in the elites from colonial times. So you think about uh, this famous book by Samuel Stone in Central America, The Legacy of the Conquistadors. You have a history, right, of many Latin American, many Central American presidents and congressmen in, you know, in Costa Rica, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, can be traced back uh, their lineage to uh, two of the most impo important conquistadors in colonial times, right? But it's not really clear about how they reproduce themselves and the mechanisms of this elite persistence on the one hand, right? And second, it's not necessarily true that elites really control uh, society and the state as much as in the Engerman and Sokolov uh, world view, right? There are many different factors, uh, you know, cultural factors, sociological factors that I mentioned earlier, that seem to be also very important at, at understanding the reproduction of inequality in Latin America. And, Moreover, this uh, also uh, brings the fact that there has been enormous you know, socioeconomic change in the continent in the past 200 years. And this has left spaces for different and alternative political institutional projects uh, to come to power, right? So if you think about you know, the Mexican revolution, the Bolivian revolution, uh, the, uh, El Salvador, or even Venezuela recently, at none of those episodes, the previous elite came back to power, right? Um, perhaps a very salient example of this uh, in Latin America and these anti-elite projects, right, that have come to power is Peronism, right? 
and uh, Peronism came to power in 1946. And, you know, they have this worldview of uh, trying to, uh, uh, against the oligarchy that had governed Argentina for, you know, since independence. You can see this in, in, in his quote, you know, that Perón was very much uh, worried about the oligarchy, which had enthroned itself in the country for so many years. So he wanted to change the system, the political system, the economic system, but most even the sociology of how the uh, Argentinian society uh, was organized, right? And this was very important to understand uh, the fact of Peronism and many of these movements that have called uh, for change in Latin America. So uh, Peronism was a very important social revolution. Here's a picture, you know, about uh, on this October 17th, uh, uh, you know, the Loyalty Day in Argentina, where, you know, uh, Domingo Perón was, Juan Domingo Perón was imprisoned by, by the military. And, uh, you know, the, the movement that he had created, much of it attached to labor unions, right, made this huge protest in Buenos Aires, and they forced, basically, Juan Domingo Perón out of, out, out of prison. He eventually won the presidency four months uh, later. So this has been... Uh, there has been a lot of movements in Latin America that have been similar in its uh, in its missions, uh, not necessarily in scope. You know, Perón, for example, did try to change things. For example, this is a picture or a graph that shows how Peronism redistributed wealth in the 20th century after it came to power. Uh, it, it graphs the top uh, the income shares of the top one percent, top 0.5 percent, and top zero. 0.1% in Argentina, so they're very rich, rich uh, uh, people. And you can see that the share, the income share that they hold um, went uh, down considerably after the uh, they came to power. Of course, then they had to uh, uh, stay on the sides because of the mili military dictatorships. But uh, in, in essence, they did try to change things. However, like in many other projects that have tried to change things in Latin America, they eventually succumb to this view, uh, these powerful forces of clientelism, right, that have retained the continent, in this case, Argentina, back into the past, okay? Um, now, so there has been change, but its scope has been uh, difficult in some places, and there are particular places, uh, spaces in Latin America, which um, the elites really do not control. So this is very different than the Engerman and Sokolov view, something that we, we think creates large areas for possible change in Latin America, in particular the frontier. So if you go back to why the US was a successful country in the, 20, in the 19th century, perhaps the most prominent argument was made by Frederick Turner, which is a, which is a was a very famous historian. And he posed this hypothesis that, you know, the economic success of the United States after independence had to do precisely with its experiences with the colonizing the West, basically with the frontier, right? They, this is a quote which I really like and I teach in my courses, where he, he clearly states, for example, that, you know, the success of, of the United States is due to this existence of an area free of land, you know, uh, and the advance of American settlement westward. Um, and later he says, for example, you know, American demo democracy, right, the institutions and the social mobility that are very intrinsic to the development trajectory of the United States is fundamentally the outcome of the experiences of the American people in dealing with the West. Why? Because there are all these possibilities at the frontier, right? And this also this can also be the case, right, uh, for Latin America. I'm going to try to show you later with different studies that we have done in the in the last uh, in the past years. There is ample scope for different political and institutional projects in the frontier. Some of them can be good, some of them can be bad, but but uh, there is ample. Now, this. This also uh, this is also like a very uh, poetic view, right, of American West, you know, and all this uh, freedom and equality of opportunity at the frontier. In fact, also 
Uh, there are many examples um, in the in the American frontier where you know there was eventually chaos. We all have in our minds uh, maybe the um, pictures of of cowboys fighting in the 19th century. This is a famous uh, cowboy fight in 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 Topston, Arizona, perhaps one of the most famous cowboy fights in the United States. Um, and it became a synonym of how the West actually in the United States was very chaotic and, and, and state didn't operate very well. Um, and, 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 and so there are different spaces to be exploited at the American frontier. And the same can be true for Latin America. So, so maybe one of the spaces that we should be looking at, right, is precisely the frontier in Latin America. And, and you know, we think that precisely the frontier in Latin America has been a very understudied research um, in economics, but possibly in other social sciences as well. So, so there are many interesting things going on at the frontier in Latin America. And I'm just going to show you two examples through uh, some of my current research projects. Uh, and we can discuss later about this. One project, for example, has to do with uh, trying to figure out uh, or, or understand why is the Colombian Pacific. So sorry, I'm, I'm going to focus on Colombia because it's basically where I do research currently, but obviously I think this has broader implications for our understandings of Latin America and of, of Latin America in general. So the Colombian Pacific, uh, for, for those of you who are not uh, knowledgeable of the context, um, is, what is, the is the poorest region actually in the country. Uh, it was, you know, this is a question that goes back, in fact, to a, a, a recent Economist article uh, in, 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 a few years ago. They asked the same question: Why is the Colombian Pacific so poor? And and you know, they in the article, which sort of recovers most of the traditional economist view on the Colombian Pacific, the reason is that the Colombian Pacific uh, has traditionally been uh, was. Uh, used uh, collective property rights. This came about through Law 70 of 1993, right, um, in the country that allowed Afro-Colombian communities to petition for co collective property rights um, to protect their land. So in, in the view of uh, Afro-Colombian communities, this was a push, right, necessary to include in the constitution for them to uh, defend the ter territory because they have been uh, subjected to persistent forced displacement in the past. So property rights at the frontier, basically in, in, in this part of the Colombian have not been very secure in particular for these populations, a history obviously of exploitation. So they view you know, collective property rights as a way of protecting their land. Now, this obviously has problems with how economists view property rights, most economists would argue that this is problematic and in fact was the main argument in the economist piece because collective property rights are not well-defined, right? They reduce incentives for private investment and public investment as well because in, in this case, the government has to negotiate with communities the investment uh, or the construction of roads or public goods and many times in many uh, communities don't really want um, these kinds of um, investments. Um, land cannot be pledged as a collateral. This is a typical De Soto effect in economics, right? And, and so this reduces private investment as well, and people would have a really hard time coming out of poverty. Now, if you look closer, the Pacific, it's a very diverse region in the periphery of Colombia. Um, and this is ongoing project, an ongoing project I have with Eduardo Montero, who's a professor at the University of Chicago. We're trying to understand this part of Colombia much better. And one of the striking features of the Colombian Pacific is that more than 90% of the population are Afro-Colombians who are descendants from enslaved Africans that were brought to Colombia during the colonial era, right? Um, and you know, in the uh, economist, uh, traditional economist view of of the world, you know, uh, 
it neglects the fact that obviously this uh, policy of collective property rights is embedded in particular in a particular context, uh, which is the Pacific, and these uh, Afro Colombians have inherited who, uh, different cultures and institutions from their ancestors, their enlaved, enlaved uh, African ancestors that were brought to Colombia. One of the things that we're looking at is whether, for example, certain particular inherited characteristics from their ancestral cultures may have helped or hampered Afro-Colombians efforts to adapt to collective property rights and to actually bring about a, a different kind of possibilities using a, a certain type of policy that traditional economics would not uh, uh, approve or like, right? What we do in this project, for example, is to retrace basically the uh, African ethnic origins of uh, Afro-Colombians in the Colombian Pacific uh, using last names. I'm not going to discuss everything because I don't think we have time, but basically uh, what we do is that we take advantage of the fact that during the colonial era, last names of uh, slaves in the Colombian Pacific were used to marker particular skills and points of origin from Africa. And those last names have been inherited through time. So what we do is we use micro level data right now from the Colombian census, and we link exactly uh, these last names to their African origins. And we can link those in turn to the ethnographic atlas, which has been widely used in Africa to characterize the institutions and cultural uh, and cultures of different African ethnicities and try to understand whether you know, particular cultural characteristics inherited from their ancestors have helped them to adapt to the Colombian environment. I'm not going to bore you with the uh, econometrics, but basically you can see um, in the points right on your left from where in Africa most of the people we have traced have come from. They fairly match, for example, the uh, uh, transatlantic slave trade database, which has been widely used in economics. Um, and you can see on your right, basically, uh, the different uh, ethnicities that we have been able to trace in the Colombian Pacific currently, right? One thing that is very interesting, for example, is that you can see a clustering of different colors uh, throughout uh, the Colombian Pacific that tells you that there is a clustering too of potential ancestors that lived in, those, in that particular area. This just shows you in, in different places across the Colombian Pacific, what is the most do predominant African ethnicity that we can find uh, today. So, and, and one of the things that this, so this is ongoing work. I don't have, uh, we don't have still a concrete results, but I'm just going to show you uh, some of the ongoing uh, uh, work and the results we have. It's very interesting because we can see, for example, that particular uh, cultural um, attributes, right, from their ancestors um, can have different effects in the Colombian Pacific. For example, those ancestors, those uh, Afro-Colombians who today uh, whose ancestors came from places with a high political centralization, so better institutions in Africa, perform uh, economically much worse today, right? For example, uh, they have higher levels of poverty uh, systematically, and in contrast, places, uh, Afro-Colombians whose ancestors came uh, from ethnicities uh, with strong kinship ties, uh, in fact, today exhibit lower uh, poverty levels in the Colombian Pacific. And we try to th we think that you know different characteristics were uh, useful for adapting to uh, the Colombian Pacific differently. What's more important and relevant to the public policy of today, right, is that people um, who came and so 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 you can see that there's been a sort of reversal of fortunes in the case for these people that, that um, have in, inherited these cultural traits. In the case of those whose ancestors had better institutions in Africa, they actually, uh, uh, they do much worse, but they use more pr private property rights, 
and they use less collective property rights in the Pacific. This is very different than uh, those who had uh, stronger kinship ties. We're trying to think that one possible interpretation for this, for example, is that precisely because at the frontier, state weakness has been so prevalent, right? And the state has not been able to um, help these communities. Um, historically, no, uh, the state has even been a tool uh, um, uh, throughout history for exploitation in many cases. Um, that other attributes, for example, having higher social capital or strong kinship ties um, are more important for adapting to a place where uh, the institutions are very weak and that collective rights in this context actually can be useful for uh, helping these communities come out of poverty. Um, another example, so, so this is just one example basically that we wanted, I wanted to show you. Another example also comes from Colombia. This is actually joint work with James and, and other co that I'm going to mention later, comes from, um, from Colombia also too. You know, there are many spaces in Colombia that are not governed by the state. Um, and one of those instances comes, uh, or a very prime and important example comes from a Colombian paramilitarism. So, and even though this is centered in Colombia, I think there are analogies to different places in Latin America. You know, think about the favelas, for example, in Brazil, or think about uh, different places in Mexico where illegal armed groups operate and control large swaths of the territory, right? Um, and to the point, right, that uh, you can have a state within a state and that somehow uh, resumes also or, or can be traced back to a history, for example, of how caudillos in many places almost entirely governed themselves uh, independent from the state or operated outside the state, the scope of the state. So this is a quote, a nice quote to motivate this, this uh, empirical, empirical study from a, a paramilitary commander called Ernesto Baez. He asks, you know, they, they had to go to, uh, they demobilized in 2006. So they, the paramilitarism was a, a, a movement that came about to fight the expansion of, of guerrillas in the 1970s and 80s in Colombia. This is, again, you can find many examples of this in Latin America as well. At the height of conflict, of the Colombian conflict in 1997 and 2006, there were sort of uh, more or less 30, 30 blocks form of 100 different uh, fronts. And the key thing is that they were really largely autonomous to govern in different places to the point that this paramilitary, par paramilitary commander, Ernesto Baez, you know, when he's in front of a judge and they demobilized in 2006, he asked, you know, the judge, you know, can you tell me how a small independent state like ours could operate within Colombia? And I think this is very telling about many places of the Latin American frontier, right? So again, different projects, this is not this is not a good project <laughs> or a socially desirable project, but but again, it shows you that there are uh, lots of possibilities at the frontier. One of the things that we're trying to uh, uh, that is very interesting um, is trying to understand: okay, if institutions are not uh, are not working and people are not constrained in these places, but by institutions, what drives the behavior of government? of governance, and in this case of paramilitary behavior in these places. And, you know, we've, we've been working on this project for what, like more than 10 years, I think. And, and you know, the initial field work that we did, uh, which was more than 20 years, suggested us actually that a key thing to understand behavior in the periphery was the social origins of people. In, in this case, in particular, the social origins of those who commanded these paramilitary blocks. And uh, one, one of them, one of those commanders was, was very telling about uh, the fact that he thought that a key thing to understand uh, was that he was a peasant. He had a peasant origin and a very different origin than other commanders uh, in the network of paramilitaries. And you can see here uh, that, uh, you know, 
One example is this very famous paramilitary commander, uh, Ramon Isasa, which uh, operated in, in the Magdalena Medio, which is a, a region in Colombia between Bogota and Medellin. Um, it was, they operated freely for more than 30 decades, basically, uh, even though there were uh, military bases uh, close by and you know uh, elections going on and politicians would come to these places. Uh, anyways, um, and so this is very, so we're trying to understand what's driving the variation at the frontier, right? Um, and what we did in this project, again, this is a joint project with James, Maria Angelica Bautista, Ragnar Torvik, and, and Rafael Torres. And uh, we're trying to understand whether, you know, the social preferences of uh, peasants can uh, drive different behaviors. And in particular, how in the values of peasant commanders, uh, in particular, uh, reciprocity, right? There is a large literature in sociology, for example, in history, in, that speaks about how peasants have a very different uh, view of the world. And in particular, they have, they have to develop norms of cooperation because uh, the state is basically always absent. And, in, and so these norms of cooperation, of reciprocity, are very important for maintaining cooperation in the periphery. And, and one of the key things that we wanted to understand was, OK, how can this drive the combination of public good provision and violence? Basically, like one, one ex demobilized paramilitary said to us, you know, you know we, can, we can govern through dreams, basically, with the provision of public goods, or we can govern with fear, basically, the provision of violence. And what drives this in the periphery, in the frontier? So we, co we collected a lot of data, basically, from paramilitary transitional uh, uh, paramilitary data from transitional justice tribunals. You can see a map here of where those fronts and blocks were uh, operate and operated in Colombia. And you can see that basically most of the country had a particularly uh, uh, a particular front or block assigned. And what you know, what we find basically is that uh, these predictions were right. Basically, uh, peasants, for example, because of these norms of reciprocity do provide more public good at the frontier. You can see we're comparing fronts that were uh, governed by a peasant to fronts that were not governed by a peasant commander. And we're comparing results at the boundary of these fronts. You can see that basically there is a discontinuous job, for example, in the provision of public goods just uh, at the right of the cutoff, meaning peasants marginally uh, uh, they provide more public goods than non-peasant commanders, and also they provide more, more targeted violence. And you can see again that they, in, in particular, are more uh, successful in implementing massacres. Uh, and we tie this to a, hist uh, you know, a model of reciprocity, basically, that can explain this behavior. So again, we just wanted to show that the, there are possibilities at the frontier, and it's important to understand how the frontier operates. And I'm turning back to you, James, I think. You know, just, just, just on the theme of, you, know, you can tell what we've been thinking about is how to do research on the frontier. And here's another frontier, you know, and it's a frontier that came up in um, uh, Felipe Valencia's lecture on Tuesday, where he talked about this famous paper by Melissa Dell that Juan Sebastián referred to earlier about the Potosí Mita. So a kind of very specific, famous example of an extractive institution apparently leaving a long shadow. Uh, so, so how did the Spanish organize the Potosí Mita? Well, they, they used local elites and local political institutions to mobilize labor to work in the silver mines in Potosí. And here's an example of the officials of an IU that I was mentioning before. I showed you a photograph of it before, but I want to point out, you know, what what my friend and collaborator Pablo Celaya is doing. He's got the bag of coca leaves here, and if you're in, you know, uh, the indigenous world in Bolivia, you know, which is quite a lot of the society, and you want to talk or you want to discuss or you want to just meet people, then you have to give, you have to do hype, you have to give three coca leaves and you can see they all have the coca in front of them and then you have libation the libation nowadays is um 
is kind of fire water from Cochabamba, um, and not Cochabamba, sorry, it's from Santa Cruz, it's from the Media Luna. Uh, but I just want to point out, this is like, it's just imbricated in culture everywhere. And when you go to Bolivia, you just see like coca is everywhere and coca is used to kind of greet people and make agreements and make promises and enter into contracts. It's just like part of life in a very fundamental uh, way, okay? So, so in the periphery, in fact, that village, you know, this place in Orinoca is that part is in the territory of the Potosi Mita. OK, what did President Banza decide to do, you know, with the encouragement of the Drug Enforcement Agency? This is what he decided to do. He decided to go for zero coca. OK, so so in Colombia, they spray the coca, you know, uh, but in, in Bolivia, here's some military with machetes cutting the coca down. OK, so in, in what's the consequences of that? So I've been, we've been studying this with Pablo Celaya and Pablo, who you just saw, and Carlos Molina, who's a student at MIT. Uh, here's, in a, in a nutshell, the, 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 the story, OK? The gray line is a US counter, and dr counter drug assistance, which ramps up when President Banza goes for zero coca. The red line here is the mass vote share. So the, the movement towards socialism, the political party that in 2005 puts President Evo Morales in the president, president, presidential palace, okay? So you can see the yellow thing is a sort of, before the mass really starts, it's a sort of party that kind of anticipates the mass. So, you know, that could be here or not. But what you see is that as the coca ramps up, the mass vote share ramps up with eventually Evo Morales becoming president. So, so this project is looking at how this coca eradication basically creates this massive reaction in traditional society. First with the cocaleros, who was a trade union you know, of coca farmers that Evo Morales played a prominent role in. But then that spreads to you know, traditional society. Why does it spread to traditional society? Well, you just saw in that picture because coca is so, so kind of deeply embedded in the culture in Bolivia, okay? And what we're showing in this research is that these traditional institutions played a very important role in kind of catapulting the mass into power. So exactly the institutions that uh that the Spanish had preserved and fostered, you know, the Republica de Indias in order to exploit the indigenous people, then became an asset which allowed indigenous people to capture power. And, you know, that's that's what you could say Evo Morales did. So here's, we actually from the, in La Paz, we got from, you know, the government, this very detailed map of the, this is more than just the Ayu and the, you know, the Ayu and the Maiku are like very much in the highlands. So this also includes the lowlands, you know, what they call the Media Luna in Bolivia. So it includes other, you know, including Guarani people in the far east on the border with Paraguay. So it's more than just that, you know, um, so, 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 but this is just to give you some sense. And what we're trying to do is sort of study here you know, the extent to which this spatial distribution of indigenous territories with these organizational capabilities and traditional institutions and social structures, you know, helped uh, build this political movement and help predict the mass vote share. So without getting too much into the regression evidence, you know, community lad, you know, this is just data at the voting table. They have all the voting table data. And you can see that, you know, the dependent variable is just the, you know, is the number of votes for the mass party at the voting table. And, you know, this is just looking at the coca suitability in the voting table. But what I want to put, put, put here is the community land. So this is just whether or not that voting table was in, you know, community, uh, community land in the Ayu or, you know, the, 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 the analogous institutions with Guarani or other people, you know, down for, in the Media Luna. And you see a very significant effect of, 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 of you know, of, of being in the community land. So the communities helped organize this, this, this reaction against anti, the anti-coca policy. And what's the consequences of that? Well, there's lots of consequences, but here's one that I like. You know, here's the title of the paper, The Return of Pachamama. Uh, this is when Evo gets elected, and this is data we've got on uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, names. So we have the names of, uh, we have millions of names of people naming their children. And what you see after Morales Evo comes to power is a significant 
increase in the you know the propensity of people to give their children indigenous names you know so this is this is a kind of common measure of kind of identity that people have been using a lot recently in economics and social science and i think you know that we can look at social mobility and all sorts of other things but this we think reflects kind of an empowerment you know of of indigenous people as a consequence of having a kind of indigenous person self identified indigenous person in the presidential office now you're all going to think oh yeah but we know what happened with evo you know uh he fixed an election. He got out of control. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So we're back to a mechanism that Juan Sebastián mentioned earlier, you know, the so-called iron law of oligarchy, you know. So so, so there's a lot of, there's new people coming. There's entrance. There's the mass, you know, but power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, even in Latin America, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, what's interesting about the Bolivian story, of course, is, you know, is that that project is back on track now, Evo Morales notwithstanding. But I do think like one of the pressing research topics we think is indeed trying to understand this iron law of oligarchy, not Engelman and Sokolov, not, you know, elite hereditary, you know, in the inheritance of elite, but how come when there's so much agency and entry and new people, you still seem to have these very perverse uh, dynamics and we've been looking a little i've been looking a little bit at that with two of my uh two of two of juan sebastian's colleagues at the universidad de los andes in bogota leopoldo ferguson you know and and, and santiago torres uh we what we've been doing in in the case of colombia because uh, you know is like looking at all the newcomers so what you see in colombia is this flood of newcomers into politics OK. And, you know, this is happening everywhere. It's happening in, you know, it's happening. It's happening in the upper house. It's happening in the Senate. It's happening in the camera. You know, it's happening with governors. It's happening with councillors everywhere. So all these newcomers. So what we're looking at is new distinguishing between people who've never held political office before and kind of people who have. So think of newcomers against incumbents. So you might ask a simple question, you know, looking at Evo Morales and, you know, with his little de Diablo, you know, his little horns is, you know, what do we know? On average, is it true that in Colombia, newcomers are are associated with improvement or or is it all the same is it like the iron law of oligarchy there's new faces you know but 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 they behave just as badly as everybody else you know think of the the recent um you know president of peru you know who's again from the altiplano you know poor teacher whatever you know within a year he seems to be corrupt his family is corrupt and what you know is that are we doomed to that? And 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 the answer, you know, in in Colombia is that on average, new people basically don't do anything different. They're just as corrupt. Public policy is not any better. But there's significant heterogeneity. All right. So so if you look at uh, index of public good provision, and you distinguish between parts of Colombia, like you split Colombia between at the median you know, municipality, and you split it between high inequality and low inequality, in places with low inequality, there's substantial improvement in public policy when you have a newcomer. In places with low, below median intensity of violence, you know, and above median state presence, newcomers are associated with significant improvements in public policy. So we call this a conditional iron law of oligarchy. There's, it's an interaction. It's an interesting interaction between, yeah, between the history of inequality, between the history of state weakness and violence. But it shows that newcomers do bring change if the context is right. And there's a sort of interesting interaction between the context and an agency, if you like. That's one of the things in Gargadea's book, I think, which is which we think is so interesting, that there's a lot of agency, there's a lot of scope for different projects and ideas, but there is some legacy of the past. Yeah, there is inequality. Yes, there is an absence of local, you know, political participation in the colonial period. And that that matters in some context. And, you know, this matters here in the Colombian context. But again, it shows there's nothing inevitable about this. When there's scope, new people do different things and they do Productive things. They improve public policy. They're less, they're less, they're less corrupt. Okay. So, 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 you know, so the, I think the point here is to say, you know, 
the, the, the discussion of economic history of Latin America is kind of burdened by this obsession with the past. And I, you know, mea culpa, I've written a lot of things on this myself, you know, but, but, but if you look at the world today in Latin America, if you look at what's going on in Mexico, you know, you look at President Castillo in, in Peru, you know, that guy could never have been elected president of Peru in the past, you know. Yes, there's perverse aspects to it, Chavismo, you know, what happened with Peronism, you know, uh, but but there's also good things happening, like in Bolivia, you know, like in the Pacific coast of Colombia, you know, and I'm sure everyone can think of other examples, you know. So, so I think there's a lot of heterogeneity there, and there's lots of new things happening, and, and much of it is happening in the frontier, which we think is sort of exciting, because because the North American, you know, that's that Frederick Jackson Turner narrative is like, that's where the dynamism comes from. So why not? Uh, why not in Latin America? And I think, you know, for us, the challenge now, you know, for economic historians and social scientists to try to understand this new equilibrium that we're in in Latin America, you know, and it's not the Engerman and Sokolov equilibrium. Maybe there's some hangover from that world, but we're in a very different world with a lot more potential. And it seems to us, you know, a lot more scope for optimism about about the future, you know, and remember Marty's second question that that Juan Sebastian said we weren't going to do a great job of. Yeah, he's not very clear about what it means. You know, what does a government in harmony with the country's national constitution look like? But, you know, the part of his essay that I think, you know, where there's more of a sense of this is, you know, what, when he kind of sort of says, you know, what a vision we are, like looking at Latin Americans. We're a whole fancy dress ball in English trousers, a Parisian weight coat, a North American overcoat and a Spanish bullfighter's hat. The Indian circles about us, the black pursued from afar, alone, alone and unknown, the campesinos, rose up in blind indignation against the disdainful city. We wore epaulets and judges' robes in countries that came into the world wearing rope sandals and Indian headbands. So what are you saying, if anything? It's not an institutional agenda, but it is an agenda of kind of radical inclusion, it seems to us. And I think that's why we like the examples of the Pacifico, you know, or the Cocaleros, or the there, you know, there's a tech, something tectonic happening in Latin America, you know, and here's a final way of seeing it, talking about Peru and President Castillo. When Alan Garcia was president of Peru in the 1980s, he had, he had like his 12 apostles, like 12 business tycoons who he tried to negotiate economic policy with. And here they are on the left, you know, and I just want to point out a couple of things about them. First, they're all from Lima. They're all from the coast. Nobody's from the Altiplano. And they're all white, let me say, okay? 2020, uh, uh, Francisco Durand, a Peruvian sociologist, wrote a book, The New Apostles, The Twelve New Apostles, okay? And here they are, and half of them are from the, the Sierra. They're not from the coast. And let me just show you some photographs. Let's, let's we just show you photographs. And what's fascinating about this is if you look at the business tycoons at the bottom, the people from the Altiplano are radically different sociologically from the people. Yeah, there's some people from the coast. There's the menus, there's the descendants of Italians or whatever. But Peru is this fabulous, diverse society, you know. And, 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 and now politics is reflecting that diversity. Economics is reflecting that diversity. And there's a level of social mobility here, which is kind of dramatic. OK, and I just want to show you, you know, an optimistic like for us, this is an optimistic picture about, you know, kind of the change in society that Mati was talking about. And, you know, and what's the economic consequences of this? You know, dynamism. Think about Peruvian cuisine. Peruvian cuisine is taking over the world. What is Peruvian cuisine? It's a it's it's a it's a mixture of of all of those influences and all of those aspects, you know, and this is something, you know, this is a photograph I took in La Paz when we were doing that field work, you know, this is a cholet, it's a cholo chalet, you know, and here's another piece of like terrific innovation, you know, and economic dynamism and creativity. And I'm just waiting for them to start building cholets in Chicago. I think that was supposed to be our last word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the fascinating talk. So it has been great having you. Uh, we have a couple of questions. We have several questions, so but I will group them. So for the first part, 
basically just beginning to the constitutional conflicts, there is a question about why do you think all Latin American countries adopted presidential models? And if that has impacted the long-term economic development of Latin America. Who's answering that, me? Both. I have a paper on it. You have a paper on it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like the Brazilians had a discussion, you know, in, in the 1980s, after the transition from the dictatorship the, in Brazil, they actually had a vote on whether to go, you know, whether to bring back the king and whether to have a, a, a parliamentary system and both lost, I think three, I think the king got 3%, if I remember correctly. Anyway, so, you know, I think that's an interesting question, you know, for in the United States, you know, they wanted to have a model which was distinct from the British. Uh, and they started off without a president, you know, the, under the Articles and Confederation. And then they decided that didn't work very well. So they 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 introduced it, you know, uh, they introduced a president. I, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a good explanation for presidentialism. Like in some, you know, for me, I'd see it as something deeper, you know, like we don't really have a good theory of why most human societies historically have been ruled by kings. You know, why do you have kings? Probably the origin of that is like, religion and supernatural authority and you know this idea of sort of being run by one person i don't think there's good evidence one way or the other you know about the consequences of that for economic growth uh there's not good research on it you know it's a very difficult problem to study empirically um and you know and places with presidents have flourished like in the united states and places with presidents have have, have you know have have been have been disastrously unsuccessful also so so i i I, you know, I guess I would go back to thinking about, yeah, I don't know, I have a good explanation for that, honestly, about why this presidential model was so hegemonic in, in, in the Americas, because I think, you know, Gargadea's book shows that there's so much experimentation and kind of lateral thinking, but not, not at that level. I don't think there's a non-presidential constitution other than uh, the experiment in the 80s in yeah. Brazil, yeah. Another question that I found quite interesting is, can we say that to some extent, this new research agenda that you are positing challenges the ideas of why nations fail? You, you can answer that, Juan Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think, I don't know, like, I, I, you know, I think, Yes, of course it challenges it. Yes, you know, but but this is this is social science. You know, do I do I think do we know the truth? You know, no, of course we don't. There's so many things we don't understand about the world. You know, that's what you know. And I personally, there's many things I don't understand about the world. And and I, you know, I think we we try to keep things very simple in why nations fail. And I think it explains a lot of the variation. But it, but there's many things that it doesn't explain. And I think. You know, what we're pointing to here is things that are not well explained in why nations fail. I mean, some of it is, you know, the fact that you have these ungoverned spaces in the periphery of Latin America. But I don't think we tackled well, you know, all the creativity of these spaces. And I don't think we tackled well, you know, this issue of change. You know, we talk a lot about the iron law of oligarchy, and but we don't describe well the mechanisms or you know, or, or, you know, and I think this thing, you know, I think our, one of our points today is this to us, this all looks much more fragile than than the conventional wisdom suggests. And that's very exciting in terms of the potential for the future. There is a question directed to Juan to his research on the Pacific in Colombia. So are you more or less saying that the unsuccessful results in the Pacific are due to the fact of ethnicity? I don't know this area in Colombia, but I believe education is the target in this kind of rural areas. No, no, no. I guess the point that I was trying to make is that there are all this cultural diversity in the Pacific, right? And that some of the historical uh, ancestral characteristics uh, inherited from African ancestors can be channeled, right, in positive ways. And in particular, uh, what I tried to discuss was when, for example, uh, Afro-Colombians can use collective rights better uh, to uh, uh, come out of, climb out of poverty, right? And that's that's something that 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 it is happening. And so, so that that was basically the idea. Yeah. And I think that there is scope for understanding more the, the the frontier in different places, right? 
of Latin America and the diversity of Latin America, like Martise, for example, provides uh, future uh, uh, avenues for, for research. Okay, one final question is about the role of geography. So it seems like geography plays an important role in explaining Latin America's fragmentation, both in terms of the polities, the size of the polities, and also internal, like in Colombia. So what would you say about that? I don't think we like that. Uh, we're not very keen on that interpretation, right? I'm not sure. I, I think James coincides with me, right? So yeah. like, I think different places in the world have very bad geographies as well, or uh, different or rough geographies. You know, if you look at the United States or Australia, for example, it's not like they have uh, very easy uh, geographies. They also have winters and summers and, you know, different stuff going on, deserts. So, so it seems to us that that is, uh, and also it's a very pessimistic, again, view of the world. It's very deterministic, no? It's hard to change geography right now. So, although we do have climate change coming up, but, but in general terms, it's just very hard to think about what can be done to change geography. So, yeah, I yeah I agree with that. I don't you know I don't think geography explains much about you know the this you know I mean Argentina is all flat you know but San Sarmiento was thinking about the periphery and the core and Facundo and you know civilization and barbarism and you know like for me that's just typically in Latin America it's just a big excuse you know this this idea and especially in Colombia you know that oh we're doomed to poverty because we have all these mountains and we can't govern and all of this you know it's not the mountains that stop the Colombian government building a road to the Pacific coast. You know, if you go to Quito, which is the capital of the Choco in the Pacific, you know, one of the big departments there, there's no road there. You can't drive from Medellin. It's a hundred kilometers away. It's just a joke. It's because people have been so marginalized and neglected politically and administratively that no one can be bothered to build a road. The technology is perfectly straightforward. It's just that no one in Bogota or Medellin wants to commit the resources so I think it's like to me the, the 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 you know the frontier is as much a kind of cultural and you know and and political construction as as a geographical uh, one. So with that, I think we can conclude both the lecture and the course. We appreciate everyone coming. We appreciate, of course, our presenters today. Thank you, James. Thank you, Juan. And thank, thank you, you, everyone, for attending. Yeah, very excited to take part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.